feel like Mick Jagger here. Um, I, I, it's really an honor for me to be here. Um, I, I really enjoy uh, enjoy speaking. Last time, and, and uh, when Kay asked me if I could uh, speak again, I was more than happy to do so. Um, I really think what OPTA is doing is, is really wonderful work, and in any way that I can contribute, um, I'm very happy to do it. So let's get started. We're going to have a lot of fun, and we're going to learn a couple of different things. And my first slide, as you can see, uh, remember, shop till you drop. Um, and the, 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 some, the one thing that we always have to remember about creating a brand is nothing becomes a brand unless it sells. So branding really means that something has to be successful in the marketplace in order for it to actually become a brand. Um, and as most of the women know, shopping until you drop is just comes second nature. <laughs> um, so um, I'll start out with one of my favorite stories about two guys sitting on a park bench. Um, and one guy's eating ice cream, and the other guy says, you know, I once wrote a book about how to lose weight eating ice cream and cookies. And the guy eating ice cream says, wow, that's great. Does it work? And the guy says, well, of course not. He says, so what's your point? He says, I sold four million copies. <laughs> so sometimes what we buy is not necessarily the best product on the market, but it is well marketed and well branded. And we're going to discuss about some, about some of those aspects today. Um, so we're going to start with a brand provides the architecture for people to adopt an experience and share their experience with the world. The brand aggregates niches of that experience in music, culture, fashion, and lifestyle. People don't know what they want, they want what they know. How many people have iPhones? Quite a few. How many people have Galaxy, Samsung Galaxy? Okay, so we have, uh, and that basically covers the room. <laughs> That's it. Now, oh, <laughs> wow. and you're going to go down with the ship. <laughs> um, and, and, and there's a perfect example of brand loyalty. Okay, the <laughs> loyalty. The, the um, and that's what brand loyalty is all about. And of course, Apple has garnered the best brand loyalty in the marketplace. They just recently took the number one spot as being the number one global brand over Coca-Cola. Uh, this has never happened. Coca-Cola has always been the number one, one brand global. And when we think about that, we think about how has Apple done that? How? I mean, think about it. They are a computer manufacturer that had the same resources, this access to the same consultants, access to basically all the same things that every other company had, but yet Apple has surpassed everyone by such a huge, huge margin. Why? Why is it that Apple did that? Well, as we look at that, we understand that there's a psychology that happens in a brand that becomes part of your identity. So the reason that we only have two phones, I'm sorry, <laughs> two phones as a majority and more likely, um, is because you have chosen the phone that you have chosen to be part of your identity. And for some of the women in the room, whether it's Chanel or Gucci or Michael Coors or whoever it is, because we know that women love shoes and handbags. And women are a major driving force in the marketplace. But let's get back to Apple. Apple did something very, very different and really mostly because of Steve Jobs. And that was, Steve Jobs made a decision 
that they were not going to be a computer manufacturing company. They would be a consumer product manufacturing company. So they created products that were consumer products that we could embrace, that it was just not a piece of technology. It was something that we could relate to. So when everybody else was saying, hey, we've got all these features and benefits, Apple said, hey, we're different. We're going to buck the status quo. We're going to be the rebel, the outspoken one. We're going to force you to think different. Remember that ad? You see it all the time. What happened? Well, that combined with a cool-looking phone, not the best phone, and I know those of you who have <laughs> iPhones and probably stood in line to get it, um, think it's the best phone, but it's really not the best phone. It's, it's a very good phone. And for the people who have the Galaxy Samsung, or the Samsung Galaxy, for you, it's the best phone. But that's what happens, and that's what, that's what makes our world, what it is. But the key here is people don't know what they want, they want what they know. So now, if you have a Apple phone or a Samsung phone, how do I get you to buy Nokia? <laughs> Scary, right? <laughs> Because you already know what you want. So now, if you have the challenge of being the chief marketing officer for Nokia, your job is to convert people. But they, those people already know what they want. They want Apple. Right? So that chief marketing officer can't go to the... To the uh, CEO and say, everybody wants Apple, or everybody wants Samsung. They don't want Nokia. You're fired, right? That's his job. And your job, irrespective of what you are doing in business and or in life, revolves around the same thing. People don't know what they want, they want what they know. So you go to the same restaurants, you watch the same TV shows, you shop at the same stores. You basically run on rails, kind of on autopilot. And then somebody says, hey, for instance, I asked a few people, if, if, if I asked, hey, um, have you seen this new show, Breaking Bad? Everybody's talking about Breaking Bad. Why? Because it's departure. It's, it's outrageous. It's nothing like we've ever seen before. But that word of mouth now creates a buzz because it is so unique and different and people embraced it and saw something that inside of them made them feel something and said, wow, that is, that is just so unusual and different and, and makes my life that I thought really was really screwed up. Man, that's nothing compared to this guy. So we somehow find something within us that embraces them. And our challenge every day when we are either working for a company or entrepreneurs and in developing a new uh, company or product is to get into the marketplace and create some kind of acceptance, some kind of adoption. And people in marketing, like myself, we use uh, fancy terms like the law of diffusion of innovation. So when you introduce a new product, there's going to be a certain amount of time that's going to take for people to adopt. Or as I like to say, one thing that is always underestimated is the variable cost of customer acquisition. So you may say, I've got this new product. And the market is um, that there are you know, 10 million people that 
eat these cookies, buy these bags, use this service, whatever it is. And if I only capture 0.1% of that, I will have this kind of revenue. The problem is, is that it is very hard to difficult. It's very difficult to actually measure how much time it's going to take those people to convert to your product. So that leads us to what, why, and who cares? I don't know if you notice here, but the world is a big place. And then this is a car driving off a cliff. <laughs> so everybody is selling something all the time. The question is, today, we are bombarded constantly. Our lives are extremely complicated. So I threw up a couple of questions here, like, uh, is it too easy to get a divorce? <laughs> Don't ask me. <laughs> Trust me, it's not too easy. Uh, <laughs> is secondhand smoke harmful? Is it? Some people would say, well, depends what you're smoking. <laughs> uh, do you have confidence in blocks? Some people will say, what is a block? Do you prefer sunrise or sunset? How many people, by the way, have seen a sunrise? Is that interesting? Only half the room have ever seen a sunrise. Think about that for a second. And if we, if, if we really, and, and then if you, so you can't answer the question, do you prefer a sunrise or a sunset, if you've never seen a sunrise? <laughs> So, but think about that for a moment. Do you prefer to see the sun rising? It's a brand new day. Or do you see, prefer to see it setting another day has passed? It's an interesting perspective as to how we all think differently. And we are all different. Whose marriage do you admire? Whose marriage do you admire? I'm sorry? Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie. <laughs> there you go. How about you? Uh, my parents. Okay. How about you? Me? Uh, shoot. Um, probably not my parents. <laughs> <laughs> Kim Kardashian. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, and if we went around the room, we'd get some very, very interesting responses. And we are, I only asked three people, okay? In this room, we'd probably get different responses from many different people, whether it's Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie, Jolie or uh, uh, Kim Kardashian, or President Obama and, Michelle, and First Lady Michelle, or your grandparents, or the choices go on and on and on. But it tells us something about that person. So, who are you? Who are you? This becomes something that is very important in today's marketing because who are you marketing to? We have two groups of people. Some of them have an iPhone, and some of them have a Samsung Galaxy. We could have a war here. <laughs> there could be a battle, right? It's like a, it, 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 it's a turf war. Um, but these are choices that most of the people in this room have made for specific reasons about who they are. And that is what creating a brand is all about, is who is my target audience? Because when I introduce a new product, why should anybody care? 
If I had the greatest phone in the world, I'm going to introduce the DeSantis phone. It is <laughs> unbelievable. It does everything that every phone does, but not only that, it will heal wounds. <laughs> right? Would you care? You probably wouldn't care. Because, eh, because people don't know what they want, they want what they know, right? Because you can get phones for free right now. And by the way, there's a new app out there that you can put your finger on your flashlight and it will tell you your pulse. So in actuality, we may see a phone that heals wounds. <laughs> you heard it here first. <laughs> so that takes us to our target market. And love. Look at this guy. I mean, he looks like whoever that is, if it's his mother in law, he's like, what am I getting myself into? Um, so, it's not important who likes you, it's not important who hates you, it's only important who loves you. That's it. Period. End of story. Everything else is meaningless. Love is the most important thing. And we know that for a fact. That man loves his Blackberry. <laughs> I mean, come on. Can, can, can it be more obvious? I mean, we know why the people who love their iPhones love their iPhones. We know that. I mean, I know I couldn't pry it out of your hands. I couldn't do it. Right? Is it, would anybody be willing to give up their iPhone for a, 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 a Samsung Galaxy? Obviously, Samsung Galaxy has tried that. Right? But they realized that they had to go after a different target audience. And that audience loves that phone. Those of you who have the Samsung Galaxy, have it because you love the features, the functionality. It is more attractive to the nerd. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. Jose, am I right? Yeah. So, but that was very smart of Samsung, wasn't it? Instead of going head to head with iPhone, they said our USP, our unique selling proposition, is going to be different. We're not going to go head to head with them, we're going to go over here where they are not. Which brings us to what you want is not always what you need. And women understand this very well. Because they don't need 20 different handbags. And I'm probably being conservative. <laughs> right? Just because Hey, it's fall. I need a new handbag. <laughs> right? And I can't use the handbag that I had last year because that's no longer the color <laughs> that's fashionable this season. <coughs> and if I use that one, then all the other girls are going to know that <laughs> that's, that's black. She's using last season's bag. Did you see that? <laughs> and women go through this all the time, and that is why <coughs> the engine of consumerism belongs to women. And we, we applaud them, but <laughs> especially those of us who are in the market. Uh, so, understanding that is very, very important because there is an, there's an emotional need, there's a 
cultural value at our core, at, at, for some of us, not all of us, no one can disagree that, that Apple has created a culture, right? It has its own, just like, like Facebook has its own culture, right? And within that culture are all these little niches. There's, there's, I mean, I don't spend a lot of time on Facebook, but I do have a Facebook page, and I use it really just to monitor different people. And some people are extremely spiritual, and some people are very technical and techy, and some people are very uh, political, and some people are very sexy. Um, there's a lot of sex. And I uh, <laughs> haven't enjoyed that one, actually. Uh, and Within that, we now know that Facebook has become a personal broadcasting platform, right? That we, as a culture, irrespective of where we came from, want to express ourselves, we want to be heard. And Facebook has given us that outlet. And now, marketers, uh, are looking at Facebook and every other social media trend to see, to find out, to extract more about us, which is a big question as, in as far as our privacy concerns, right? Because now we are always connected. We are always connected in everything we do, Everything that you say, everything that you Google is somewhere. Whether it's in the cloud or somewhere. We don't know. But Big Brother is watching. Whoever Big Brother is. Or maybe they shut down this week. <laughs> <laughs> so, when we're looking at introducing a product, introducing um, a new company, introducing a new idea. The first thing I always ask people to ask themselves is, what is your criteria for success? And a lot of people don't know how to answer that question. Because they don't ask the right question. Many people get married, and after two or three years, she says, I think we should have a baby. And he says, what? I hate babies. <laughs> Never ask a question. So the same thing happens in business. What is your goal? What is your goal? What is going to be your criteria for success? Is it, is it money? Well, obviously you're in business, you want to make money, but we know, you may know what you do, but you may not know why you do it. And why we do something is very, very, very important because that gives us the meaning of why we do things. So this slide is called Stuck in Time Traffic. We have traffic in the sky, we have traffic on the ground, we have traffic in our brains, we have an overload, an explosion in clutter, right? We have so much information at our fingertips at any given time, so many choices, so many different problems. So that leads us to how do we identify things, right? So I like to demonstrate something I call fast brain, slow brain. Fast brain is your brain able to identify, process, and interpret something immediately. Like this. Everybody know what this is? 
It's a like, right? Right? <laughs> You've all seen it on Facebook, right? <laughs> or, you know, when somebody does something right. You know, that's it. That's, how about this one? Who knows who's, uh, right? Star Trek, right? Live long and prosper, which is my favorite one. I mean, does it get any better? Live long and prosper? I mean, come on. I mean, give me a break. How about this one? We all know what that is, right? Who has it? <laughs> we, we see this on the freeway a lot, don't we? Now think about that for a second. Everybody knows what this is. Can you remember the first time you actually experienced it? How old were you? Where were you? You can't even remember. It's so long ago. <laughs> right? The first time somebody in school or a friend or somebody said, eh, your big brother, big sister, somebody. Some of you went to your parents and said, Mom, what is this? <laughs> You're like, <laughs> so our brain is able to immediately process, interpret that sign instantly. And it's the same thing when you see the, you can see a Starbucks logo miles away, right? You can see it. You process it immediately. Now, if I ask you, what's 167 times 14 divided by 4? What happened? Now you just went into slow brain, right? Just like, whoa, what did he say? So, that requires more processing. And that's the same thing that happens when we see a new product, a new brand, a new something that we don't immediately identify. And we have to think about it. Right? So when you see something new on the shelf, and now remember always, People don't know what they want, they want what they know. So when you go and you buy your milk, or you buy bread, or cheese, or noodles, or whatever, clothes, anything, you're on rails, you're on autopilot. But there's somebody out there that's trying to sell you something else. Some on those shelves out there, right? And that changes all the time. Companies, products are competing for your attention all the time. And it's very important if you work for a company to understand that. And if you're an entrepreneur to understand it. Because you're trying to break through the, cup, the clutter. So what happens is that gates are down, lights are flashing, but the train isn't coming. You've put your product out there, you've done whatever you're going to do, you have a marketing plan, you've determined you've got a product that you want to sell, and you've done all this stuff. But guess what? At the end of the day, you go, nobody came to the restaurant, nobody bought my product, I built the web page, and nobody, I got no traffic, or I had a lot of traffic, and nobody bought anything. We are always on, always, as I said earlier, we are bombarded. We have never had so much information, so many products at our disposal, right? You can compare shop all day long. You can look at anything. You can be at a store and you can you can see, gee, can I buy this on eBay? Let me check it out on Amazon. 
So we have these choices available to us all the time. So it's never been harder to get people to jump species. What does that mean? Well, this is a picture of the Wright brothers. Everybody knows who the Wright brothers are, right? Well, you know, what? the Wright brothers, when they uh, were attempting to uh, accomplish manned flight, they weren't the only ones. There were several people who were trying manned flight. And many of them had better education. The Wright brothers and the entire team, none of them had even a high school diploma. A lot of the competition had lots of money. The Wright brothers didn't have money, they had a bicycle shop. They used the proceeds of the bicycle shop to try to fly a plane. A lot of other people had, uh, had um, media following them, had big support from companies. The Wright brothers didn't have that. But what they did have is every time they went out and tried to fly their plane, they, bought, they brought enough spare parts to crash five times. They were prepared to crash. They were ready to crash. They expected to crash. So, a lot of people think that marketing is an art. <coughs> well, it, it, there is an art too, but it is truly a science. It is a science that is measurable, that can be measured as long as you know how. But it is not an exact science any more than why does a good fisherman catch fish over a bad fisherman, or a good golfer play better than a not so good golfer. It is it is an understanding of the elements. And there's a certain amount of talent that has to be involved. But as far as we're concerned, there's some key elements that we have to remember. Remember that somebody's got to love your product, right? If they don't love it, they're not going to talk about it. It's kind of like if I'm if, 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 uh, if uh, a guy was, wanted to marry you and said, I want to marry you because you're interesting. <laughs> it doesn't work, does it? You need, you need to hear that love thing, right? Interesting doesn't work. So, for instance, just recently, um, I saw a couple of movies. I saw Rush, fantastic movie. True story about James Hunt and Eric Lauder, who were Formula One drivers uh, back in the 70s and had this rivalry between them. And uh, an unbelievable story where James uh, uh, Hunt uh, is this uh, alcoholic Formula One driver and Eric Lauder is this tactician who actually burns in the car and, and, and survives and, and continues to win more Formula One races. Unbelievable movie. Anybody think they'll go and check out that movie? Maybe, huh? Why? Because I'm very passionate about it. I also saw Gravity. I fell asleep. <laughs> <coughs> the Gravity worked to pull my head down. <laughs> Why? Well, I, and I'm not, I'm just saying, it's just me. I, you know, there was this, it was a, a two-person cast, and there just wasn't a lot of dialogue in space. A lot of this <laughs> Picture of the Earth. <laughs> oh, that can't be good. <coughs> then 
Merkel. I didn't love the movie. And what happens is, is that happens in everything in our lives. We are influenced by different things and different people because that's the way we are. So we must constantly define, refine, and scale things. So let's look at some objectives. So one of the things that is most important in my methodology is the competitive landscape. The single most important reason why companies fail is that they do not do enough research on the competitive landscape. Your competitors will tell you everything you need to know. Because they probably have tried everything. The big guys have tried everything. And the little guys have failed. Right? So now, is everybody familiar with uh, what a SWOT analysis is? Right? Is everybody? Anybody that doesn't know? Let me just... Because mine's a little different. Of course. <laughs> so SWOT is an acronym for strength weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. I like to call my schwacht. <laughs> which sounds a little James Bond-ish. Schwacht, <laughs> schwacht analysis. Um, I add culture and trends. Trends become very, very important, right? Because if you're not following, if you're not paying attention to that trend, if you're not paying, not paying attention to that culture, you will miss your mark. And many people have done that. Introduce products at the wrong time, the wrong color, the wrong season, the wrong, they, they, they didn't realize that somebody else had already introduced those features and benefits that they were leading with. So that trend becomes very important. It's kind of like the, uh, the, uh, three uh, daughters of Farmer John who go and, 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 and see uh, uh, their father and they say, Daddy, we have some, some, some young men coming to visit us uh, to take us out tonight, so we want you to be nice. Well, Farmer John, he didn't want to hear about that, so he gets his shotgun. And he's standing by the door. And the three guys are going, oh my God, we're going to get killed. we got to get creative. So first one says, I got an idea. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna come up with a poem and I'm gonna impress him. So he goes up and knocks on the door. And Farmer John opens, opens the door with a shotgun and the guy says, hi, I'm Joe. I'm here for Flo. We're gonna go to the show. Can she go? <laughs> Farmer John says, wow, that's pretty impressive. <laughs> okay, come on in. Next guy says, wow, that worked. I like that. John opens the door with a shotgun, and he says, hi, I'm Eddie. I'm here for Betty. We're going to have spaghetti. Is she ready? And John says, you know, that's, that's pretty good. Come on in. There's a trend going on here, right? This is working. So the third guy comes up. John opens the door, and this guy says, Hi, I'm Chuck. Boom! <laughs> All right, so. Wow. <laughs> what rhymes with Chuck? All right, never mind. All right. <laughs> so, if you're not careful with trends, you could get shot. Right? If you don't pay attention, then you will fail. And the psychology and physiology and mechanics of marketing are such that you have to pay attention to everything. As A.J. Flaherty once said, who was the former CEO of Procter & Gamble, when asked 
what is a brand? He said, it is everything. It is everything from naming to the color palette to the tagline, to the packaging, to supply chain management, right? How many times have you went to a store to buy something, they said, we're out, we're back or Excuse me? So all of this effort went into getting you to actually go somewhere, buy something, ready to give people your money. And they say, <laughs> sorry, we didn't plan for this. So that affects the brand, right? That, and why did that happen? Because of supply chain management. Or quality control. How many times have you purchased a new product and you said, this is garbage. Something about Apple. Steve Jobs understood that consumers have to have a wonderful experience when they buy the product. When you buy an Apple phone, when you buy an iPhone, it comes into the box, the packaging, Gorgeous. Right? It is extremely well designed. The phone is well designed and it's beautifully packaged and it takes you four seconds to actually feel that experience, which is measured. Everything is calculated to make that experience wonderful. And that's the difference between the people who understand the brand and the experience and the people who don't. And we see it in a lot of different um, categories. Let's take Lady Gaga. Yes, she is a very, very prolific songwriter. However, she understands the art of fame. Right? She understands how to like keep us in with wild hairdos and crazy outfits where we're just kind of like, <laughs> what? Meat? <laughs> but what happens? We're talking about it, right? Just recently, MTV Music Awards, Miley Cyrus. <laughs> right? People are still, she's still in the news now. Is she crazy, or is she brilliant? Right? So, she's still in the news. Justin Timberlake won, but he's not in the news. So who really won? So, it's a different world in how you get noticed, how we get noticed, how things get noticed has changed dramatically. So, for instance, as many of you know, um, Red Bull. Well, Red Bull was founded by a guy by the name of Dietrich Mateschitz. That's his name. Dietrich <laughs> Mateschitz. <laughs> and he doesn't care that I use it that way because He's a billionaire! <laughs> now, he was a branding guy, just like me, and, uh, and like many of you, he worked for a branding company called Brandix. And he's quoted as saying, if I had to brand one more toothpaste, I was ready to jump off the building. Because what happens when you have a branding and marketing company, you get a lot of the same products over and over again and you have to figure out how to differentiate that product. So when I see another skincare company come in, I'm like, oh, oh, that's what we need, another skincare company. Or when I get somebody that comes in and says, oh, I, this, 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 this acne product is better than proactive. Oh, oh, God, right? 
I hope you have a lot of money because it's very expensive to go into that category because it's a cluttered category. All the women in the room know the choices in skin care are beyond infinity. It, it just never seems to end, right? So, Dietrich identifies Red Bull and says, I'm going to come out with an energy drink. Do you know that three different agencies told him that he would fail? Three! Anybody know why? Anybody want to take a guess? It's bad. That's right. It tastes like... <laughs> right? It's, a, it's definitely an acquired taste. But Dietrich knew what he was doing. And what most people don't know is Dietrich created this eight and a half ounce can. We didn't have an eight and a half ounce can. Remember? We had Coca-Cola, we had Pepsi, we had 7-Up. They were 12 ounce cans. But he came up with this can different value proposition, and guess what? It was two dollars. Two dollars. Everybody, especially at Coke, said, this, this guy's crazy. He's gonna sell that for two dollars? Never work. Well, guess what? It worked. It was like when Dick Clark said, the Beatles will never make it in America. <laughs> so, sometimes, when the person who understands marketing, understands who his target audience is, understands behavioral economics, understands the art of fame, understands deployment, understands the competitive landscape can win because Dietrich said I'm going to be I'm going to fill that unfulfilled segment there's no one else that has an energy drink and that's where I'm going to be so when you look at the competitive landscape and you were to do a SWOT analysis, or as I call it, SWOT analysis, thank you, Sean Connery, <laughs> um, and you do strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats, culture, and trends, and you were to look at every single one of them. Now, Coke is still a much bigger brand. I mean, I think, uh, something like 12, no, actually it's more, I think, right? But it's somewhere, maybe around 15% of people have a Coke for breakfast. Hey, I don't know if it's a breakfast of champions, but <laughs> for some people it works. Coke is a super brand, it's a super global brand. But that didn't fade. Dietrich. Dietrich said, there's an unfulfilled segment because I'm going to have an energy drink with B vitamins and taurine. And we still don't know what taurine is. <laughs> but Dietrich knew how he was going to position it, irrespective of the fact that many people didn't like how it tastes. Because Dietrich understood the law of displacement. And the law of displacement is, is for me to get you to buy something, to jump species, to stop doing what you're doing and do something else. I've got to get you to switch. How do I get you to switch? And the difference is for most marketing people, most people 
who are in this space who don't understand it at Dietrich's level is that he was targeted. He said, I'm not going after Coke drinkers. I'm not going after 7-Up drinkers. I'm not going after Pepsi drinkers. I'm going after... Anybody have any ideas? I'm sorry? Coffee? No? Mountain Dew. Mountain Dew. Do the do. Remember those ads? He went after young, extreme sport enthusiasts who were drinking Mountain Dew. And why were they drinking Mountain Dew? Because it was loaded with sugar, dude. <laughs> so he said, I'm going after them. He didn't care if you liked it or you hated it. He only cared if you loved it. Right? So, Dietrich understood that philosophy. So he only went after people who loved it and supported them and incentivized them to love it. Now what does that mean? Well, incentivization makes things happen. I could get just about anyone in this room to wash my car. Right? Well, if you're thinking, <laughs> some of the girls are thinking, yeah, right. <laughs> but there's a price. Right? The first MIT divides incentivization in three parts. Number one, it's financial. So if I say to you, or you, or you, or you, or you, or you, that I want you to wash my car, and I'm going to pay you a thousand dollars, well, guess what? You're probably going to fight to wash my car, <laughs> right? But well, that's easy. So we all understand the, the, the financial incentivization model. The next one is community. which relates to our identity, right? So I own an iPhone and you own an iPhone, or I have a Gucci bag or you have a Gucci bag, or I belong to Oka, or you belong to Oka. <laughs> it's community. We all belong to Facebook. We have this common ground. And the third one is glory. What comes with glory? Pride and aspiration. Right? This young lady loves Angelina Jolie. Right? And I don't blame her. I love her too. <laughs> I can't figure out what to do with that Brad guy. Um, so, That aspirational part has a big part in our lives. And Dietrich understood all of these factors. So he understood that if I go to these extreme sport dudes, right? I mean, these were dudes. These were like, dude, you see that flip? Like, I'm going to do a double next week. You got to drink this Red Bull stuff. And guess what? Play hard, party hard. Drink this with vodka, party all night. Dude. Now I want you to think about something that is, 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 is fascinating in the world of marketing. Red Bull is the number one mixed drink on the planet in bar. Okay? We all got that piece of data? Right? Red Bull and vodka is sold in bars more than any 
other mixed drink on the planet. I want, I want that to settle into your brain for a second. Because, isn't it interesting that Red Bull has never advertised Red Bull and vodka? <laughs> You've never seen it. It's the number one drink, mixed drink, on the planet, but yet Red Bull has never said, hey, mix this stuff with vodka. And party. They've never done it. It has evolved entirely organically. Imagine that. Can you imagine if you had a product that somehow just <clears throat> flourished amazingly, it grew exponentially, and you didn't even have to advertise it. People were just doing it. I don't get it. It's like a drug, right? It somehow became its own subculture. It became this black, gray market. And it's obviously extremely successful. But that is the power of love. It's like blackberry. <laughs> but it's like iPhone. But it's like the Samsung Galaxy. But it's like Gucci. Or one of my favorites, Louis Vuitton. Louis Vuitton, for most of the guys in this room who aren't familiar with this brand, it is the most expensive designer, luggage, handbag company on the planet. And they, and by the way, most of it is Naga uh, And they never have a sale. <laughs> they never have a sale. Right? Phenomenal. And women will die. Die. Get a leave of time back. So, Brands have a way of, of creating their own culture that relates to our identity that we share with everyone. And that's how brands grow. Because of that loyalty, that dedication. But getting back to Dietrich, Dietrich was very specific. He didn't go after Coke, he didn't go after 7-Up drinkers, he didn't go after Pepsi. He went after Mount Pendu. So, he understood the law of displacement. So, many times when I am discussing, introducing a new product with someone, I will say, who do you see, or what do you see, your product replacing? And I don't care what it is. I don't care if you offer a service and you say, hey, um, I'm, a, uh, I'm a dentist and I want to expand my business. Okay, great, super. I assume you're a good dentist. Who do you see yourself replacing? Who out there has got the customer that you want. He says, that's easy. It's this guy on the corner of Olympic and uh, Figueroa. It's Dr. Gold. Man, he's got clients. He's, he's got Angelina Jolie. <laughs> really? Okay. So now, let's just focus on his clientele and what he does. Now, why is that different? Because most people do not get specific. They just kind of do this broadcasting. And broadcasting doesn't work because we are bombarded. It's kind of like 
it, it's kind of like that guy at the, uh, at the uh, club that's talking to six different girls, right? And the girls know this, right? The guy's talking to all these girls instead of just paying attention to one girl. He doesn't know what he wants, so he's trying everybody. Instead of just saying, I want this girl, and just focus. And that's the same thing that Dietrich, he said, I'm going to focus on just one consumer. And what happened? Red Bull is now the ubiquitous energy drink on the planet. Which leads us to behavioral profiling. So now, that grows. Behave millennials drive behavior. Young people drive behavior. So, why is, how many people are into angry birds? Anybody in the game in here? No. <laughs> Boring. Um, <laughs> so, gaming is a big part of our lives now, in case you hadn't noticed. There's this thing, you know, and it's been around for a while. World of Warcraft and Grand Theft Auto, I'm sure you've seen the ads. Call of Duty, it's, you know, the whole first person shooter. Candy Crush, there you go, <laughs> yay. <clears throat> candy Crush, okay, how many people playing Candy Crush? There you go, oh, yeah. <laughs> five people. <laughs> um, we probably have about a billion people playing the games, and it's growing every day. This is very important. All of this is very important because Young people drive behavior. And whatever it is that you are doing, whatever it is, whether you work for a company, whether you're an entrepreneur, what you want to do is you want to ask yourself, what is shareable? What is shareable and why should anybody care? Right? So if I spend all of my time trying to convince you to do something, and you don't share it, then it's not really beneficial to me. What happened with Dietrich was, is he picked these young extreme sport dudes that would hang around in groups anyway, and they would spread the word, and then some of these guys would come, become heroes in extreme sports, which he said, I'm going to support them, which became aspirational for the other guys. <clears throat> and that became part of the culture. And then we had these little mini Coopers with a can of Red Bull on the back. Maybe some of you have seen them, maybe you haven't. But they were called mobile energy teams. And we'd get very attractive young women that we recruited from Hooters. <laughs> and they would come out in their mobile energy outfit and you just